Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, if more people come in, great. If not, you guys are the audience, and that's fine with me. Yeah. Um, my name is Cindy Schlinker Davies, and I have worked for Cooperative Extension for uh, the last 16 years, and in February, I actually retired but um, I work part-time for them with food preservation. That's kind of been my niche, I guess, and there's not a lot of other people in the state that have that niche, so uh, it's, it's fun because I'm pretty passionate about it and do it myself, um, so I enjoy talking about it. So this morning we're gonna talk about uh, food preservation, the why of it, and the ways to do it. So, um, <clears throat> Really the why of it, good morning, good morning, is food safety. And why do we need to know for sure what we're doing? It's because of food safety. Especially when you get into canning, you really need to know what you're doing so you're not gonna make anybody sick or even kill them with what you've canned. So that's really an important uh, factor, as everybody knows. But let's start, first of all, I'll just hit a few tips about freezing and then drying and then canning. And freezing, of course, is the easiest uh, uh, and um, most common way to preserve food. And everybody's um, frozen things, some a little more correctly than others. Um, uh, it is important when you're freezing to, uh, to make sure that you're putting your uh, produce or whatever you're freezing in a container that is really more appropriate for freezing. And um, all of us have probably stuck something in a cottage cheese container or a yogurt container, stuck it in the freezer, didn't put a label on it. Six months later, you're looking at it and you don't know if it's barbecue or chili or what it is. So spaghetti sauce maybe. So it's really important that you, number one, use freezer containers and number two, label them. and. Um, I have to say that I'm better at talking about this than I do myself because I'm, I always think, oh, I'm going to remember that spaghetti sauce and I'll know that. And, and then, you know, six months later, I'm looking at it like, what is this? Back, back the old cycle. But freezer bags are cheap and easy. And all of the more recent freezer bags have a space for writing on. And what I do is just a quick note to myself what it is and the date. Um, when I froze chili this year, I would write on here, chili 21 medium or hot or whatever it was. So I um, would pull that out later and know. <clears throat> but freezing chili, we'll start with that because freezing chili is such a big thing this time of year. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have a freezer full of chili. I will talk about what happens when you don't have any more room for any more chili <laughs> and then what you have to do in other, in other options. But <clears throat> one thing about chili that's interesting that most people don't realize that um, you need to use the chili that you froze for this year before the next year. And it's good to pull the stuff that's in the back of the freezer up to the front and use it first because chili actually gets hotter in the freezer year by year. Mm -hmm. So if you have chili in the back of your freezer or the bottom of your freezer from five years ago, it's likely to number one, be so hot you can't eat it, and number two, smell and taste like the other things in the freezer. So you really wanna be kind of on top of what, your, uh, what time you're using all this and, and turn your freezer um, before you just add to the new stuff, and then the old stuff just gets pushed back even farther. So chili is wonderful. More people are familiar with freezing it. You can chop it and freeze it. You can leave it whole for rellenos, that kind of thing. But um, chili, it's, it's very common for us to freeze chili. Hi. <laughs> so um, chili is, is one of those foods that I'm going to talk about how you can do it in three different ways. But besides freezing, I'm just going to pass this around for you to see because this is really kind of interesting if you haven't. My favorite way to preserve chili is to dry it. And the dehydrator 
uh, is a good way to dry food. You can also use a very low oven, but um, dried food is um, a wonderful way to preserve food, and it's actually a very safe way to preserve food. So um, green chili, when you're out of freezer room, or you don't uh, know what to do with it anymore, it's really a good thing to dry. I have two sons that live out of state, and they love their chili and miss it. So every year, I uh, roast and peel a bushel of chili for them each, and mail it to them, and a bushel will weigh 2.2 pounds, peeled and dried. So it really doesn't cost anything to mail. And then it comes out like this, so it's almost translucent. And you can um, break it apart and use it, crumble it up and use it as a sauce or a gravy, or you can, um, you can reconstitute it, put it in warm water and it'll plump back up, or you can just throw it in a pot of stew or soup and it will plump up that way for you. But my boys, yeah, if you're done with that, that's fine. My, um, they, they enjoy eating it like jerky. So afterwards, if you want to sample any of this, feel free. So here I've gone to all this trouble so they can cook and they just want to eat it like jerky. But that's okay. It's, yeah, New Mexico true. And it really is a very intense, concentrated flavor, as is all foods that are dried, right? Because you, you're getting all the moisture out, so what you have left is the real essence of that. So um, uh, green chili and red chili dry quite well. And if you are going to mail it, that is my recommendation. Don't try to freeze or can or fresh mail chili. Um, the weight of it is a lot. Canning chili is really risky and mailing it. Frozen chili thaws out and is very expensive. And fresh a lot of times will mold or mildew on you. So um, that's why I recommend the dried. And the first time somebody sees the dried, they may not quite know what to do with it, but you quickly catch on and it becomes a new favorite thing. Um, some of the other foods that I dry when I have an abundance of, because with food preservation, let's face it, we do it because we have a lot of it to use, right? So we want to use it up. Um, I'm a sucker for the Shriner's sweet onions that they sell every year, the big 20 pound bags or whatever. And so I dry a lot of onions and I will put these out for you to sample too, but they, they are so nice and crispy with um, being dried that they almost taste like an onion ring and especially those sweet onions. So that's a kind of a fun snack uh, to have. And then zucchini or all of our squash um, is a good way to preserve squashes by drying it too. And of course our ancestors uh, dried chili and onions and zucchini for years. It's nothing new, but most people don't think to dry their squash when they've got an abundance of it. And again, I just take a handful of the squash and throw it in a soup or stew, and it will plump up in the juice, and it makes a lovely taste like fresh zucchini back in your, in your pot. But if you know much about squash and zucchini in particular, it doesn't freeze well. Mm -hmm. It's mushy when you pull it out, and it just is way too watery. It cans even worse than it freezes, so you don't want to can it. Um, so drying is really the way to go. I don't know if you've ever been out to Los Colandrinas, but they, they have um, strings of squash that they have strung. Uh, it's really quite pretty, but then they also just snap them off and use it in whatever they want to. So, so that's a, a great way to, to go. And then, of course, apples. I have apples. We've had a great apple harvest this year. You go down into the valley or any place in New Mexico and you can find apples. And so um, since we do live in the desert, we always appreciate a good harvest <laughs> of stuff. So if, if you have an opportunity to come into a lot of apples, uh, drying is a good way to go with that. You can reconstitute that if you want, but also you can just enjoy them crunchy. So um, apples work 
quite well for this, but all of your other fruits work well to um, make into a um, fruit leather. And this particular dehydrator, this is an old um, Excalibur that I'm sure it's been at the office over 20 years, but um, a lot of the newer dehydrators are the rounder version that have trays in them, and the trays are for making fruit leather. So you puree your fruit, pour it on that tray, and then that fruit leather is a wonderful snack. It's a great substitute for kids' fruit leather at the store because it doesn't have any sugar in it. You just have the sweetness of the fruit. So apples um, work okay, but if I was gonna make fruit leather out of apples or applesauce, what I would do probably is add some peaches or some apricots or whatever for more dominant flavor. And if you're trying to stretch your fruit to make um, more fruit leather. If you add even just a can of commercial applesauce to the fruit, it will make it stretch a little bit longer. So um, fruit leather is a great way to go. People always ask me how long it lasts, and the answer is I don't know. It doesn't last very long at my house. So, um, but all of your, your dried foods, what I do with them after I have um, dried them, I keep them in, in storage bags. Then I keep them in some kind of tin can, and this canner is no more than a tin can, but I keep them in an old popcorn can that I've had from Christmas 100 years ago probably, so I don't have critters that chew through the plastic and eat it, be, or pantry moths become a problem with your dried foods too. So um, drying is a wonderful way to go. If you have an oven that will go down low enough um, to about 140 degrees, that's really a great way to dry as well. Unfortunately, during the harvest, it's usually in the summer, and we don't need a house with a, an oven going all day for the heat. So that becomes a little bit of a problem. I'll tell you, if you happen to have an old gas stove that has a pilot light, that is the perfect way to dry <laughs> uh, fruits or vegetables because you can just leave it in there in that low temperature, about 120 to 130 degrees in there, will um, dry your food for you. Um, drying herbs is quite easy in our dry climate. You can literally leave them on the counter or close to the windowsill, and they will dry without any, uh, any other preparation to it. Herbs are the one food that you can actually dry in a microwave. So if you do have a bumper crop of something and you want to dry your sage or whatever, you can burst it at 30 seconds in your microwave until you get it nice and dry. But again, in our climate, just leave it out, <laughs> leave it on the counter. So herbs are really easy to dry. Uh, this time of year, I just pulled all my basil the other day. It was beginning to turn kind of yellow and look like it was at the end of the season. Um, and I made a big round of pesto which I love to make pesto, and then I freeze my pesto in those silicone ice cube trays. Mm -hmm. And so you have your pesto in those ice cube trays, and as soon as it's hard enough in there, you can pop them out and put them just in a storage bag. And again, I write on it what it was, but then I got fresh pesto basically all year. So if you have an abundance of um, of basil or other greens that you like to make pesto out of. This is a great way to go this time of year. So never let anything go to waste, right? So ba um, basil isn't one, is one of those plants that you'll have to plant again next year. So um, get as much out of it as you can. I've got mint that likes to take over the world if I don't keep it contained. So I'm not quite as careful about, you know, being that careful with my mint because I know it can live through anything. <laughs> so um, herbs, if, if I was going to uh, dry jerky, which is probably the most common thing that a dryer or a dehydrator is used for. In fact, it's kind of funny. If you go to Cabela's or Sportsman's Warehouse or one of those places, they have a whole aisle of different dehydrators for hunters that love their jerky. And they will spend a lot more for a dehydrator than if you go to Bed Bath & Beyond or one of those places and there's one little you know, plastic uh, 
multi-tray um, dehydrator for 80 bucks or something, that's more what gardeners really use. But if you're going to um, dry jerky, it's really important that you get your temperature of the meat up to 165 to kill the bacteria in it before, um, before you eat that. And this old dehydrator and many of the old dehydrators only got up to 145 degrees. So this works great for everything that I brought. But if I was gonna make jerky, I would either need to cook it for a minute in the brine and bring it up to kind of a simmering temperature before I dried it, or I need to get a dehydrator or put it in an oven where it gets above 165 degrees. So um, when I was uh, answering hundreds of phone calls every year about food preservation, this time of year I would always get calls from hunters that thought it was just a good idea to put it on the dashboard of their car and let it just <laughs> bake in the sun. And um, I said, yes, that's a very creative idea, but you could also make yourself very sick. So I would say no, right? But there's a lot of people who have dried meat over the years, literally in the sun. Um, but the uh, recommendation by USDA and FDA is to get it a little bit hotter to kill that bacteria so you don't have those issues. Um, but jerky is very, very common, and especially this time of year when hunting season goes around. Are there any questions on freezing or drying before I move into a little bit more complicated canning? Okay. Everybody should feel comfortable being able to do either one of those without feeling like you're gonna make anybody sick or cause harm. <laughs> um, the canning process is um, kind of a whole different thing in itself. And let me talk about the uh, resources for you for canning. If you didn't pick up a handout, uh, I brought a handout that has links for all of the publications that New Mexico State has done on food preservation. And um, rather than printing off a bunch of publications, you can just go to that link and read it online or print it off if you'd rather. But those, um, I think we have about 15 or 17 food preservation publications that myself and Nancy Flores, who is the um, food science specialist on campus, have done. And, uh, we, we try to stay current with what's going on um, with the USDA on this. University of Georgia Extension is where the lab is for um, food preservation. And they have this good resource that's called So Easy to Preserve. You can get this one online. That's a great resource. The Ball Blue Book that your mom or grandma may have had in their attic. This is this is the 100th anniversary and this was about eight years ago. So it's been around a really long time. This is a good resource and all of these recipes have been lab tested for safety. So it's a good way to go. And then USDA has this spiral bound guide called the Home um, Complete Guide to Home Canning. And this is actually available online as a PDF. So if you don't want to buy the whole book or you just want to read it online instead or just copy one recipe off of it, you can. And so that's really a nice feature too. So those are great resources. But on our website, uh, New Mexico State University Food Preservation, we have publications for just about anything you would want to, want to can or uh, preserve. So. Um, we have had a lot of interest, uh, well, as long as we've had the internet, with people going online and Googling how to can chili or whatever. And you're really taking your chances on what resources you're getting into. So you want to be careful to not just follow some um, homesteader in North Dakota that really likes to can corn this way, you know. There is kind of a scientific approach that you need to, to follow just for safety's sake. And you might get some good ideas about that, but you wanna come back to the basics on how to can stuff safely so you're not making yourself sick or anybody else. 
And um, in New Mexico, the areas <clears throat> that we have the most trouble with people trying to branch out and do their own thing on canning is uh, in salsa, making salsa, and in green chili. So salsa, it's really important to follow a tested recipe. And people don't like to hear that because they, they make the best salsa and they need to can their salsa. But with salsa, the, you've got to add acid to the vegetables to balance that. So um, if you're going to safely make salsa, you need to add a percentage of vinegar, lemon or lime juice or citric acid to a recipe to bring the acid level up. And a lot of people don't like the flavor of vinegar or lemon in their salsa, so they don't want to do it that way. That's fine, just don't can it. Make it fresh and eat it fresh, or um, you know, you can make it and freeze it, though most people don't like the wateriness of salsa once it comes out of the freezer. But to can a recipe of your own is, is taking a chance on it. So um, we do have a publication that has probably eight to 10 different salsa recipes in there. Um, a salsa verde with uh, tomatillos, and tomatillos can be substituted with green tomatoes. So this time of year, when people have a bunch of green tomatoes they're trying to use up, a salsa verde is a good way to use those up. So salsa is um, in the pickle category and the preserved foods in the pickling. Um, but then the green chili, if you want straight, just pure green chili, no, nothing added to it, it needs to be pressure canned. And I'll talk a minute about pressure canning. But first let's talk about water bath canning. This is probably what most people are familiar with, the old, this old enamel pot. You've probably seen it a hundred times. In the bottom of it is a rack. You need to have that rack in there so your jars don't ever touch the bottom of the pot directly. And in water bath canning, you are going to submerge your uh, jar and water over the top of all your jars, boiling water, which is what the process is for water bath canning. So with that, the temperature of the canning is going to be boiling, right? So 212 at sea level, closer to 24, 205, depending on what part of the state you live in, it can even be down to 200 degrees in different parts. So if you're going to safely water bath can, it's important in a lot of these recipes, they will, there's a chart in all of our um, New Mexico state publications of all the communities. <laughs> um, and exactly, if you live in Baird, it's at 5,800 feet. So uh, you're gonna follow directions for that. And so there's all the, the little communities. And then there are the charts all say, for altitude um, up to 3,000 feet, three to 5,000 feet, 6,000 feet, 6,000 to 9,000 feet. So you wanna follow your chart as to where you live. And even in Bernalillo County, we go down to about 4,500 up to 7,500 in the East Mountains. So it's important to follow um, the guidelines on that. And most of the publications that I have pointed out to you um, have good charts for altitude. But, so I'm going to add uh, a few minutes extra, kind of a rule of thumb for um, your recipes on water bath canning uh, is every, for every extra thousand feet, you add one more minute. So if we're supposed to cook it for 15 minutes, we go up to 20 because of our altitude. So. Um, it also spells that out usually in the directions, but that's just kind of a rule of thumb. So a water bath canning works great for um, low, I mean high acid foods, which are all fruits. So all of your jams and jellies, your pickles, um, added acid products, and um, are any of your fruit products. Um, just whole fruit, this is just a jar of whole peaches that we did this summer. And I usually, bring several things. One, number one, they're just pretty to look at. You know, canned goods are fun to just have on the counter because they're so pretty and colorful. Um, jam and jellies are um, something that most people start with when they're going to 
can and actually making jelly can be challenging and a lot of people have had many failed batches of jelly and they get very frustrated that it doesn't gel quite right. So it is kind of a tricky thing to get right. This time of year um, I talk people through how to make prickly pear jelly. That is the popular one right now. We've got prickly pears everywhere and if you want prickly pears you can just stop anywhere and pick them because nobody's going to complain if they, if they are missing a few of their pears. So, but prickly pear jelly is um, very common and uh, water bath canning process is important for making jam and jelly. Um, I grew up with my mom using paraffin on the top of her, her jam and jelly and she'd pop that wax off, scrape the mold off the top of that wax and proceed on with the jam. As I've gotten older and realized that that mold not was just on the top of it, but it also went all the way through, was not the way to go. So paraffin is not a safe way to make jam and jelly. And um, I know that a lot of people will tell me that they have, uh, they have been doing it that way their whole life and have never died from it or gotten sick. Good, I'm glad you haven't. But, um, it's better to follow the process and when you um, can your jams and jellies it's a very short processing time it's not a big deal so uh, that's really the good way to go right now um, a lot of people are making apple butter with the tons of apples that are available and prickly pear so we've got those two going on we had a really good fruit year this year in New Mexico in general but in the Albuquerque area so we had good, I didn't see a lot of cherries, but if you had cherries, apparently you had quite a few. Apricots were good, peaches were good, plums, pears, and apples are in abundance right now. So um, the years that we have good fruit available, you take advantage of it. And last year we did not have good fruit at all. It was hard to come by. And it was during the pandemic and people had gardened and they were ready to can and you could not find the lids to save your life. So uh, canning lids were really in a short supply and if you could they were very expensive. So that was kind of put the kibosh on all these excited new canners um, that couldn't find the supplies. But this year it's been a little bit better and um, there are some uh, ways to kind of get your supplies without breaking the bank. One thing, if you are going to water bath can, this, this is such huge equipment that if you're trying to downsize your house or move to a smaller place, this is probably going to go, right? So in a garage sale or an estate sale, a lot of times you can get a good price on the canners and the jars, and all of those are reusable a hundred times over, as are the screw bands, which is the part of the lid that you screw down. And these are the flats, the flat part of the lid. And on the flats, there is a um, sealant compound that's kind of, kind of got rubber and wax in it. And that's what adheres it to the jar in the heat process. So you need to use these only once. And that was the problem is you couldn't find lids um, to, to buy anywhere. But so a lot of people, froze their food or dried their food. Um, and especially if you freeze your produce, you can take it out of the freezer and can it up at a later time so you can save that space in your freezer. But um, you do need to keep an eye, if you're a canner, keep an eye on um, the grocery store shelves when these are available. You want, you want to grab a couple boxes. And I, because I do a lot of canning myself, I just, always peruse by and see if there are any available. And the Ball and Kerr um, brands are the, the most trusted. Um, they have been a lot, there have been a lot of knockoff um, uh, lids for sale online that uh, just flat don't work very well. So a lot of people have had some high fail rates in sealing and that's always frustrating to go through that much trouble and then have it fail. So if you can get the name brands, um, I would recommend doing that. Walmart's mainstay um, brand is uh, pretty reliable as well. 
And most of these things come in a little kit all together, or if you just need the jar lifter, you can buy that separate at the store or online. So um, hardware stores, they used to just carry canning supplies only during the summer, but I've noticed that there's usually hardware um, or canning supplies most of the year in our hardware stores and even Walmart. So um, that's what we need for the, the basics of canning. And if you have a big stock pot or big spaghetti pot um, that you can put some kind of rack on the bottom of it, even a makeshift rack, uh, that'll work just fine for you. If, if your jar fits in there, you can fill it with water and cover it. So um, you can check to see if you're, a lot of us have a big pot and a big pot may be just what you, you need. Maybe you're not going to be doing the quartz. You're just going to be making jam or jelly, which are the half pints or, or pints. So they don't need to be in a really tall pot. So you can save a little there and try to figure out where to store this. Uh, between the dehydrator and the, the two canners, this takes up a lot of room <laughs> in your, in your uh, garage or storage room or whatever. Now, going from the water bath canner to the pressure canner, I can actually water bath can inside the pressure canner. I just don't secure the lid down. So this works too. If you, if you just um, have room for one, but you're going to do a lot of canning of both, I would get a pressure canner and use that as uh, your water bath canner too. So pressure canning, um, this is a boiling temperature. This is kind of a steam-based process and it gets up to 240 degrees inside the canner. So it's the increase of heat is what kills the bacteria on the low acid foods that make it safe. So um, making it safe, of course, is the key. And uh, there's been a lot of people who uh, have not um, been correct in their canning and Many, especially older people, have stories about pressure canners or pressure cookers blowing up and beans all over the ceiling or, you know, whatever, burning themselves quite badly. But uh, back in the 70s, um, FDA uh, made requirements for pressure canners and cookers a little bit more specific so there were fewer accidents uh, of burning and having things blow up. And as you see on the top of this lid, I have got this little black plug. If, it, if pressure really built up in here and there was no place to go, this plug would blow out and steam would shoot out of there. Um, this thing right there, as soon as my pressure builds up in there, it will come up. And once that's up, my lid is locked and I cannot open it if I want to. So, there's a couple safety precautions built in there. But in a pressure canner, you're not going to cover your jars. You're just gonna have a few inches of water on the bottom. This little vent pipe here is where the steam comes out. And once um, you're, you start seeing steam come out of there, you need to let it go for about 10 minutes so the air actually vents out. And then I'm gonna cap it off and the dial gauge, then you'll see it start to rise. And when you get close to what you're supposed to be canning at, then you adjust your stove to have it hold at that, in our altitude, it's 13 to 15 pounds. So um, a dial gauge, I suggest if you're going to buy a canner and you don't already have one, um, if you have the option, the dial gauge is a little bit more accurate read and so that's what I would recommend. And if you live someplace as high as Angel Fire, Taos, you really want a dial gauge because um, the weighted gauge, which is what this is, goes up to 15 pounds pressure and um, you will need more than 15 pounds pressure in some of those higher altitudes. So that's, that's a little bit about that. There are many, many different kinds and models of canners. Uh, one common one is, it's called metal on metal, and they screw knobs all the way around the top of the canner. 
that works quite nicely. Those are really nice canners. They're also real expensive. This is a Presto and it runs about a hundred bucks. And in it is a rubber rim. And so I wanna make sure that that rubber rim is in place and doesn't uh, have any leaks or cracks in it. But um, this canner will certainly last my lifetime, uh, your lifetime too. So they're, they're in it for the long haul, these canners are. Um, this one, like I said, is a, uh, another way to gauge pressure canner and it's, it works quite well. It's got a 5, 10, 15 pound weighted measurement on it. I'm going with the 15 always. In New Mexico, you want to go with the highest and it, it works, it works uh, fine for pressure canning as well. So um, what's the difference between a pressure canner and a pressure cooker? Because a lot of people have a pressure cooker and can they use that? Uh, yes, if it's big enough. A lot of pressure cookers are smaller. If you have one that's this big and you have a, a, a rack on the bottom and you know you can get the pressure up to 15 pounds on that, you're good, you're good to go. Most people have a little bit smaller pressure cooker. They probably can't get big jars in there and they don't have a rack on the bottom of it. And then if that's the case, then no, it won't work for you. So you need to have enough room in your canner for air to circulate around. So you don't want it completely packed super, super tight. Now, over the last several years, the Instapot craze has been uh, very popular for people to can in their Instapot. And on a, an Instapot, the pounds of pressure, meaning the air pressure, how heavy it is on, in our altitude, in an Instapot is 11 pounds. That's as high as it goes up to. We need 15, 13 to 15 pounds typically. And so we're not getting enough pounds per pressure to make it safe to can in an Instapot. If I were to live on the coast in California, I could. But um, an Instapot, which is where they were designed, so they're assuming everybody's at sea level, right? Um, so it's been a challenge to kind of educate people that uh, it may say that you can pressure can in your Instapot, but you really shouldn't. You can water bath can in it, um, that's fine. The problem with Instapots is they usually aren't that big. So if I've got a, a like an eight, eight inch circle on my Instapot, that's only a couple pints or three or four um, half pints. So it doesn't make a very big, big batch of whatever for you. Pressure canning um, is, takes a long time. It takes a while to build to pressure. It takes time for this to steam out. And then, um, then, like my beans here that I made, these take 90 minutes to pressure can once I've got them going. So that's a long time. And then it takes time to turn off the power and bring the pressure down before I've been able to open up the, the canner. So if you don't have all day to spend on it, don't start because <laughs> uh, it really is a process. Now with the green chili, it's not near as time intensive. By the way, these beans, I've got Chico's in them. So if you see them, they've got corn, dried corn on the bottom. And this year for the first time, I tried that just to see how I'd like it. And I think it's gonna be kind of a nice addition. Um, I do a lot of canning. I've got a good friend that we can together and we recently did a 25 pound sack of fresh pinto beans from Estancia and 74 jars later, we have beans. So 25 pounds makes a lot of jars of beans. So if you see us giving out beans on the corner, that's why we just got so many. Next year, we're gonna cut that in half, I think. So we don't need that many. Um, but anyway, the chili, and I have a publication on green chili. Most of the publications, uh, we borrowed from other extension offices around the, the country, but this one we created because we are the state that has green chili, right? So um, green chili needs to be pressure canned. The time to can it is only 35 minutes. Um, if I was using this size jar, which is very typical for, for canning, I could double stack, meaning I could put a second rack in there and stack another 
but so I can get about 24 jars of chili in my canner. So that works out quite nicely. Um, the green chili is the one thing that has made more people sick from can incidences than anything else in New Mexico. And I have had many stories, I've been teaching canning for 15 years, and I've had many stories of uh, people over the years that um, have lost members to botulism from in improperly canned food or uh, gotten very sick from it. I have one story, I think the first year I was teaching canning and it truly scared me to death, so I thought, okay, I've got to get this message right, you know. She was from Wagon Mound, New Mexico, and her grandparents um, and uh, her two or three aunts and uncles that were children at the time um, all died from improperly canned green chili. She, the grandmother was an infant, and because she wasn't eating solid food, she didn't eat any of it. She was the only one that lived from that whole family, and it was just because it was improperly canned. And who knows, back in the 40s or whenever that was years ago, um, even what kind of directions there were for how to do it properly. But really, um, now a lot of people will try to argue with me that, that chili is a, peppers are a higher acid, so they should be fine water bath. Well, they would be fine water bath if you added some extra acid to it, but we're purists and we don't like the taste of acid in our green chili, right? So, so you really need to pressure can your green chili. Now, red chili, um, we have yet to come up with a really good time on red chili. So the recommendation is to not can your red chili sauce. If you want to can it like green chili like this and then turn it into sauce, that's fine. But most of us like to make a sauce and then have the sauce. We can freeze it, we can whatever. But um, what happens with red chili, and I don't have the food science background really to, to get into the specifics of this, but um, red chili separates and there's a film of oil that comes on red chilies if you've ever yeah. seen that. And so if you're canning it, you will have a layer of oil on the top and then water and then the, the red chili itself on the bottom. So it's very funny looking. Um, but we haven't been able to get the pH balance read on it to do it. So the recommendation is to not can red chili. If you're going to make a red chili sauce with tomatoes and other things, you can, you can do that um, safely and there's recipes for that. But again, if you're like me, I'm a purist. I don't like a lot of other stuff in my red chili, so I don't want tomatoes and other stuff in there. So um, the recommendation then would be to um, freeze red chili sauce or just keep the, the pods that are dry and then make it into fresh sauce when you, when you like it. So um, of the foods up here, I've got green chili, I've got green beans from, we have a um, urban oasis garden on the extension property and they, they let me go out and shop in the garden to see what I want to, to can. Um, so that's where my green beans came from. And I've got pinto beans that are pressure canned. The rest of these are water bath canned. I don't even have any samples of jam and jelly there but uh, you know we could fill up the table with all the different things that you can that you can can and um, in the summer I usually do hands-on canning classes this summer I did uh, a series of five hybrid classes and I had more people um, online than actually coming into the lab and really that's the fun part of it is to can with other people and to come in and get your hands in it. But um, people were still a little nervous about um, being around that many people in close quarters. So uh, we didn't have that many canners. But I'm hoping that next summer we'll be able to do uh, the series of canning again. And I offer, I kind of go through the series twice from jam and jelly, pickles, salsa, tomatoes and fruit, and then pressure canning. And then I also do a class on dehydrating. Um, so if you're interested, uh, 
next year in doing hands-on classes. We'd love to have you. And the information on the info sheet that I made copies of also has um, all the different publication links, but it also has our website, um, bernalioextension.nmsu.edu. And on that website is listed all of the classes that we offer. And if you're not familiar with Extension, uh, we are the ones that host the Master Gardener pro um, classes uh, program. And we offer anything that's kind of related to agriculture. I'm on the home economic side of it, but uh, how to plant, how to grow, how to harvest, what to do once you've harvested. We kind of take that whole thing. So on our website, you can find a lot of um, interesting uh, classes that we offer. And then we've got a pretty good sized archive. Thanks to COVID, we've done dozens and dozens of classes online. We did a Ready, Set, Grow series that covers just about everything. Um, that's also, all of those lectures are available. So um, I'd love for you to participate in any of my classes, uh, hands-on, they're a lot of fun. And in the off season, when it's not canning season, um, I, I help with cooking classes, uh, teaching cooking classes. I used to be the county director, and now I just get to do the fun part of my job. I don't have to supervise 27 people that are never happy at the same time. Um, but I can just work with teaching people how to cook and uh, preserve food and, and whatever. So um, in January, and actually we have a series going on right now, we offer a cooking school for people with diabetes that want to learn how to cook for themselves so they can manage their diabetes as much uh, without as, as little medication as possible. So, and the key is um, cooking and a lot of people just really don't know what to cook or how to do it. So we offer that kitchen creations class and that is also on the handout, the link to that. But there is currently a, a kitchen creation class happening now. Uh, just started this last week. If you're interested in joining that, just follow that link and you can get into that. But that's, um, I'm really hoping we can get back into the lab next year for that too, because it's a lot of fun to cook with other uh, people that are dealing with the same issues and kind of talk about what's worked for you, what's hasn't. And just uh, a lot of people think they can't cook until they get in and they, kind of play around with it and they realize it's really not that complicated at all. So so that's kind of what's going on here. Um, please, any questions that you have, I'm uh, very glad to answer from soup to nuts and everything in between if you've, if you've got them. <laughs> <laughs>